Welcome to Rodney Veal's Inspired By, a production of Public Media Connect, the regional partnership of CET in Cincinnati, and Think TV in Dayton. Rodney Veal, our host for this podcast, is an independent choreographer, interdisciplinary artist, and all-around fan of all things arts and creativity. And he's excited to share another great conversation with you. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoy the show, please subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm super excited today. We're going to have a conversation with one of my favorite artists, Cedric Michael Cox, who is often abused phrase abstract artist, but he is just an artist extraordinaire. I think that that I've gotten to know Cedric over the last couple of years. His work is vibrant. So I'm super, super excited to have this conversation to talk about all things art and all things life and all things, everything, everywhere, all at once. This is obviously a nod reference to the Oscars. All right. So without a further, further ado, let's have this conversation with Cedric. Hey, good morning, Cedric. Good morning. Good morning, Rodney. It's a pleasure to be here. It is really an, indeed an honor. And so, Cedric, I'm just going to dive right in. And this is one of the things that's, I remember I met you, you're, and I was first introduced to your work at an exhibition of your work at St. Clair a few years ago. Yes. Do you remember that at the Triangle Gallery? And I was blown yes, away. Yes, I do remember. I was Thank genuinely you. like giddy <laughs> because I was like, this is someone who has like, who's making work in such a complete, thoughtful, exuberant, colorful way. And I'm like, who is this guy? I mean, and so when I met you and I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> it's you, you like you, <laughs> you were the living embodiment of your work. And so I, I want to talk because one of the things I was, and this is kind of like, this is your life. You, are you a native Ohioan or did you? Yes, I was born in actually Dayton, Ohio in Jefferson Township. And oh. uh, back when I was two years old, we we moved to Cincinnati. That is crazy. Do you realize that that's that's where I grew up, Jefferson Township? No kidding, really. Yeah, I'm a JT. Yeah, I'm a JT grad. So, oh, this is really giving Jefferson Township some props. So you so you left at you know, two years old, like two or three. Yeah, I don't really remember it, but you know, my 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 dad would commute from from Dayton, our house in Dayton, to downtown Cincinnati, where he worked. He was a floor manager and store manager for a mercantile stores, McAlpin's. And my mom taught and I believe she was teaching at the Wyoming school district. So it was like, it was a, it was a, it was a heavy commute for everybody, but they, but they, they wanted to build a house in Dayton at one point in time. And, you know, they decided just, well, this is too much. Let's just move to, to Cincinnati, Ohio. I and that's where my it. dad is from. That's so crazy. We have this connection, and because because I was looking at your, I was looking at your CV and the fact that you went to DAP, which is the University of Cincinnati. So it's, so I'm kind of curious, like, because DAP is not really known for being about the fine arts. So was there a goal? Mm-hmm. Like, why did you go? Why did you go with DAP? I mean, I, as opposed to like, let me go to the traditional route of you know painting technique with a with a bachelor's. I mean, I'm kind of curious. Well. You- well, you know, I wasn't really sure about what I wanted to do. You know, end of co- end of high school, you're you're just kind of just just figuring out what you're good at. You know, I I played. I was kind of like a free spirit. I played in bands. I uh, I kind of just did my thing. And you know, when when college was approaching and applying, I was like, well, you know, I don't want to be too far from you know my friends, my band, and the things that I've come to love and know. So I was like, well, let's just check out UC and. You know, I heard about DAP and DAP, even though DAP wasn't known for a fine arts, I thought maybe I could fall back into something, you know, more, uh, more substantial, maybe in, you know, design or something like that. But uh, quite frankly, as heavy handed as I am, as, as grimy as I am, as far as like my, <laughs> as far as my, my, my technique or whatever, I, I felt like fine arts could be more expressive and just better for me. I remember taking my design courses later in my fine arts career because i jumped around you know trying to taking a little bit of a design drawing and you know regular fine art drawing and life drawing and i remember going to form class where you had to keep your hands clean for all the shaping these three-dimensional paper pristine white projects and just like my pores just spewing out with charcoal and stuff like that so i I didn't take everything in order i was just really just just rolling with it and experimenting but for the most part, I, I'm very happy. And while I was there, I had a chance to study at the School of Art in Glasgow, Scotland through a fellowship. 
And it was the last year that they actually had that fellowship for UC students to go over to Scotland or for one UC student myself to get a fellowship to go to Scotland. And it was fun. That was my junior year. So it was a wonderful experience. I, I'm very grateful of it. And my professors, they were wonderful. Oh, that is super cool. And I love the fact that you talked about your gravy hands and your, your process. And so I, I've got to, I, well, because I, I'm wondering, I mean, because, you know, for those who, who hopefully will come to know your work, I mean, there's a lot of forms and figures and shapes and like distortion of form. Uh -huh. And, and I'm wondering if that was a byproduct of that kind of experience at DAP and that it's kind of led yes. you that way, or was that always your kind of, style do you know what i'm saying like there's you know aesthetic so like and so kind of curious about that i remember i remember as a kid always it wasn't about what i drew as much as the enjoyment of the shapes and the parts over layering and overlapping each other i remember when i would draw maybe comic book heroes or 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 or, or heroines with very elaborate garments you know it would always be not so much who they are but what they wore the the patterns the shapes the layering of line and imagery and that would be the most exciting part okay like we got the figure down now let's get in the groove of it let's make it visually stimulating and i always remember there wasn't really a contrast between foreground and background everything was filled to the page there wasn't really like a was what would you call it in, in music you would call it a crescendo of forms you know you know developing or sounds developing with me it was just positive negative you know it was just like really just turn it up to to 11 or whatnot and so you know in in college you know you learn to be subtle and somewhat in some ways but i think that all, all over compositional climax of energy is just something that naturally happened whether it's nervous energy of me writing down my favorite band's names and logos on my textbook in the high school and just having the whole entire thing filled, you know, to where you could not see the brown paper to where, you know, going and then you think going to art history and seeing other artists do the same thing. But of course, in a museum-esque, you know, extravagant way, you see like there's, there's, there's a place for guys like us, you know, these geometric configuration of forms, all over compositional climax. I remember when I started hearing these terms like all over compositional climax and it referring to Jackson Pollock, I started like realizing, okay, that's my language. You know, this that's the definition of what I'm trying to do. And I'm already speaking that about myself even before I was really making work like that because I felt like, you know, if I'm going to do this, I got to think about how it relates verbally to the public and how it relates you know, I don't want to, I'll say marketing. I, I was I'm branding myself. How, how do I, how am I going to make this, this art thing work when this college thing is over? You know, so you started, you know, you start identifying yourself with art history and that magic and the, the heroes of before you, around you. And, and that, I guess that's how the style developed. You know, we all have our tendencies of how we create based upon how we are mark making. And I think a lot of the work we do is based around our ability, but at the same time, it's based around what we love and how we can extract, how we can expand our ability and match it with what we love and our aspirations. And that becomes our aesthetic. I was thinking about that. Like you, there were a couple of articles I pulled up and you talked about, and you said it, you talked about influences. Who were your artistic influences? I mean, I mean, I see them. And, and, and it was like, and as soon as I saw it written down, on paper, I was like, oh, yeah, that's it. But I think you talk about it. Like, who, who are your influences and why? Why these were so important to you, these people? Well, you know, it was Lionel Frininger was an, was an artist from New York who was kind of like that fragmentation of form, kind of cubist, post-cubist kind of vibe to, to their work. You know, growing up, Aaron Douglas as African-American artist, identifying with other learning about other African-American artists in art history class made a big difference. John Biggers. Charles White. Um, and of course, you know, you have, you know, your Terrence Corbins, who was my, who later became my professor in advanced drawing. But I think, you know, you got Paul Clay, you know, you got guys like Paul Clay who just have this, this vibe where whether it's a forest or a cityscape, his squares end up becoming what he wants them to be <laughs> through his imagination, <laughs> right. you know, right. and it, it is just, 
it's just like you know it's like it could be a cityscape it could be a forest if what he says it's going to be and i love that freedom and that playfulness and also the guy who went to fought in world war one with him france mark or mark france i always mix him up but you know juan gris you know that that, that colorful cubist and just that the whole genre i mean it's it's you know i come I'm a, I'm a modernist so i lean towards you know our history's past as inspiration but there's there's plenty of contemporary artists whose work i enjoy within my realm of artists like yourself rodney i mean you're you're phenomenal i mean you have really exciting work and you know it's it's a it has a vibe to it that's that's very atmospheric but at the same time, very hard edge. You know what I mean? You're the first person to review my work. So this is kind of like, wow, I mean, I'm honored. So no, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I mean, it's just, in, I, well, well, and I, and when you say this, things, you talk about the influences in Aaron Douglas and, you know, it, and you talk about other African-American artists. I, I think about like, you know, because there's a, there's a belief system that in the abstract world of the modernist world the black voice has been kind of for lack of a better term marginalized or ignored yes and and so what i loved is that you're unapologetically embracing that history but then expanding it to now it just feels it feels historic but it feels current it feels like i'm being in the presence of and and one of the things that i find really interesting is the fact the influences is the fact that earlier you said i played in a band i don't like so you are okay. so you are a musician i didn't i didn't realize that yeah I, I played guitar in a punk metal kind of thing grind chord band and we and it was just something we did man i mean we yeah we were just <laughs> oh yes we we were yeah man i mean we 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 were really um we were one of the first in in the cincinnati area and I, our first real show because we had a we had various lineups and stuff like that. We weren't we really we were just playing around, you know, where you had, you know, how when you first start your, your first bands, you have everybody, you have three bass players, you have five guitars, you're all just like two drummers, you're all just having like, yeah, dude, we can do it, you know. And you just you, and then after a while, you kind of dwindles down to a few people who are serious. And then in the end when the smoke cleared, it was, you know, these three guys, Steve, myself and Carl, and and we our first gig was on the radio together on wave 88.3. And we were, we were, it was 1993, maybe, maybe 91 oh. or three or something like that. Oh, that is yeah, crazy. And then I was 17. And then, and then, um, and then we were, yeah, we were the first doing that stuff that, that really heavy grind core stuff. And then, and we just kept, kept doing it. But the thing of interesting thing about that stuff, I mean, my guitarist and I, I, I guess I, I identified with that music because I like the volume of rock. I love the volume of, you know, I always wanted to be, I always loved Prince and I love Rick James, but I love the clothes that they would wear. And I love the actual idea of the guitar as like a weapon. And I loved, you know, Conan the Barbarian and stuff like that. So like the axe, the guitar. So this kind of imagery as a kid kind of made these musicians like heroes. You know what I mean? on a visual level right. so and so then then but then the music you know the guitar and the sound i was listening what was i listening to yeah what were you listening uh, to at that point i'm, I'm kind of curious i mean all, yeah oh oh all kinds of, well i mean in my teens of course you're listening to all the hard rock and all the you know but we love parliament too we loved all that stuff but i think as a kid it was just it was just this you know the the 70s rock and 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 you know everything from Lou Ross to Motown, it was just, it was just we. I had a very eclectic of uh, childhood. My dad would have play Wagner, you know. We would listen to there'd be classical music, Chopin. I mean, so it was just you know we we didn't like. It just seemed natural just to to accept all musical forms in my household in my life. So it was there wasn't any lines of division. So when I would see people whether it be on MTV or listen to something, it would just intrigue me. Okay, what were they doing? Why did they decide to sing it like this? What from, I mean, it was just, it's exciting. It's fun. I just love my my generation and what we created. But the thing back to the band, and I, I swore I would not talk about the band so much and give them <laughs> shine like that because I'm no longer with the guys, but we would play these riffs over and over again and have these long 
songs that were so fast and, and frenzy. But we would play these riffs as if we wouldn't want the people to forget each riff because we would never play it again throughout that one composition. So we'd play it like eight times. I mean, it was just like nuts. It was sick. But but the thing about it is, <laughs> the thing about it is, it was like that all over compositional climax thing I was talking about. Exactly. It was so about the, yeah, yeah, like it's overkill of, of imagery. Yeah, yeah. it was just like, like just, just like fill it up, fill up the picture plane, fill it up, repeat. Up the, you're not you're not you're not repetitive, but you're just you're just you're just filling it up. There's no there's no empty space. There's no void. I mean, and that's there. You gosh, you got it. No crescendo. Is, no crescendo, <laughs> and which is which is cracking me up because that's that's like your work. There's no like, yeah. there's no there's no void. Like you're. I mean, yeah. that's what and. and and I think in myself, I always when I when I first saw your work, I thought, I always thought of your work as musical compositions. Before even right. knowing this about you in the band and knowing that you were a musician, I always felt your work was musically inspired. As, as, yes. as, as, as like it's like in there, in that sort of compositional framing, and so mm-hmm. I, you know, I just I'm like, oh. Now this all makes more sense. I mean, so folks, I mean, I have to tell people, you have got to go see Cedric's work. I mean, if you're anyone that's like loves art and, and, and your work is out as out there. And I'm, I, I guarantee you, you will go, Oh yes, you will see this, you know, you will totally see this. So we're going to take a, 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 a moment to, for a break. And then we're going to come back and we're going to continue this conversation about music, art, and all things. I'm Christine Ray, Senior Membership Coordinator of Public Media Connect. Thank you for listening to Rodney Feels Inspired By. This podcast is a production of CET and Think TV, two local PBS stations. As PBS stations, the work we do online, on air, and in the community is supported by listeners like you. If you're enjoying the show and would like to support our work, please consider becoming a member of CETConnect.org or ThinkTV.org. Plus, when you sign up to donate at least $5 a month, you'll get access to special members-only streaming videos on the PBS app through Passport. Learn more at CETConnect.org or ThinkTV.org. Thanks for listening and back to the show. So, Cedric... One of the things is and and digging it is the fact that the it's the breadth of your work. I mean, it's like, and you've been at this for almost two and a half de- decades, which is amazing. Right. So you have this Thank massive you. volume of work, and but also too, you've worked in different ways. And so I was looking at the mural work that you've done, but I want to specifically talk about the work you did with the Black Lives Matter movement because I, there was some yeah. really that was an interesting time frame, 2020. Yes. So let's talk about that. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a big time. I mean, I felt like, I don't know, I guess to describe it, the feeling that I was feeling about it, you know, we were, we're in the middle of COVID, but it was the summertime and we'll just take it all the way back to COVID. I knew this thing was going down. This, 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 this plague, if you will, I hate to describe put it frankly i mean well, i was it listening was a plague. <laughs> yeah it was i mean so going through you know going to listen to npr every day for some reason just listening to it every day which i was wouldn't normally do i started listening day by day this thing spreading and spreading and spreading and then finally it came here the next thing you know and this is like november of 2019 and then next thing you know i, I get this opportunity to do these these 64 paintings for children's hospital and that ended up happening in early january of 2020 and then but this thing kept on coming and we when rumors of shutdowns started happening and then next thing you know it shut everything down and i had to go around to all these schools that were helping me create these things and pick them up and then i i was teaching at saint francis at the time and then pulling into the lot at St. Francis and realizing no, none of the teachers were there. And I was like, cool, this is, this is what's happening. So we just, and I'm the art teacher. So obviously there wasn't really a way to, for us to do Zoom or everything for me. And so I just took this time. I was like, cool, man, here it is. Let's just, 
let's just do this art thing full time. Let's get these paintings done and just and do it. And I was also preparing for my 20th retrospective, 20 years of, ret- of painting retrospective. And I, um, and then, you know, I felt like I was in a very safe place. I felt like I was in my own world, my own safe place, even though COVID was, was running wild. But, you know, there was, I felt like I was in a safe place. And then, you know, the, the, the George Floyd incident happened. And then next thing you know, things started, things started changing. Things started, we started getting out. People, there's a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment. And there's a lot of this, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to use my hand sanitizer. Screw this. You know, it's just like, I'm tired of it all, sick of it all. And, and you just, you just, you just feel like something is erupting and, I got a phone call or a couple of phone calls that I missed from several people within the arts community about this opportunity. And next thing you know, I was put in on this, on a zoom call that happened on a Monday evening. And next thing you know, we had our, had to get our designs ready by Wednesday afternoon to present to the city. And the next thing you know, I think that Thursday we were starting to line up the streets and start painting, man. It was that oh, fast. Oh, wow. That fast. And this it is, was that fast. And, so, and this was a response to the Black Lives Matter movement. And this is this, this. Yeah. I, and so what was really, what was amazing to me about that is the fact that, is the fact that you talk about, you, because you described, this is your words. You, this is how you describe you as inner combustion, your art as inner combustion of your spirit and unapologetically colorful and happy, but you are, then addressing this anger and simmering rage of the of the African American community, you know, it, well, it was an anger and rage for the world, but this is very yes. specific to our our experiences being Black in America, and and I, I it was really interesting in the article you talked about it, and it's because I think it's really important. You said there were times, and you've only been you know you've been doing like I said two and a half decades. There were conversations where people would you would su- submit your work for for gallery shows and exhibits, and people would say, "Yeah, that's nice, but let's do let's save it for Black History Month." There have been situations like that with my work, and 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 where I've also been invited specifically for the month of February, and I think because my work is abstract, I've gotten more opportunities than rather would be figurative, but at the same time. I think I've had more experience with with people pigeonholing me in general because of me being African American, regardless of the time and history or whatever. I think there's expectations of what people expect or want from us as African American artists, whether it's our opinions on stuff or whether it's our insight on things. And I think that pigeonholing, whether it's saving us for Black History Month or contemporary art exhibitions, still happens to this day. So there's there's a there's a there's a bigotry on both sides of the fence. There's a there's a there's expectations and and pigeonholes that that people tend to put us as abstract African American artists in. And that's another conversation we can talk about too. <laughs> but as far as the poem, or there's a poem associated with the mural. Okay. And 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 the poem is called "We Want What You Want." And it was created by Alandis Powell, who was the brainchild of the Black Lives Matter mural. And she worked, she selected along with Brandon Hawkins and some of her friends, a group of African American artists to execute this. So at the end of the conference call, she started, artists started picking lines from the poem that they wanted to create artwork from. And so because of where, because family is so important to me, because I grew up in a household that, that appreciated the arts, that loved the arts, that welcomed me to, inspired me to be able to walk into any room, any situation, any point in time and feel like I belong and I'm supposed to be there and I'm supposed to be at the table and in every conversation. The, the phrase of the poem that was given to me was to raise my family in peace. I believe that was the particular line. It had to do with family and lineage. And so my design itself for the letter E in matter relates to that aspect. And because it's a timeless quality, I think, you know, there there's some political movements or certain there's certain things within world culture and popular culture that become 
important at the moment, but sometimes do not stay relevant for various reasons, political reasons, and, you know, just, just the timing of it all. And I, and I think the Black Lives Matter mural is in, in our struggle for representation is a, is an ongoing struggle and it's very, very real and it's very serious, but there's also a sense of trying to get the others, the other population, the majority the some people refer to it as the dominant culture or whatever to try to get them to understand and empathize and to where there's, there's a point where you can discuss the problem but there's a point where there's a solution and and finding that solution comes through terms like family love and understanding and so i was very happy that i was able to take that line from the poem or it was given to me i can't remember which way it happened or, right okay but but it worked. It, well, it worked very, for you. I mean, it really does. It, wor- it mean, works that's... for me visually and yeah. spiritually because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make those connections. I'm trying to make what I do relevant for all and, 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 and palatable in my own way to, to express my innermost self. But hopefully through, through trying to do that, finding the more likenesses and differences between us. But yeah, it's it's a it's an ongoing struggle. I, I believe that you you talked about earlier on how sometimes the African American abstract voice is not recognized or respected, and we have been making abstract art since the dawn of time, since the dawn of abstraction. Romare Bearden is was an abstract painter before yeah. he became the photo collage artist, exactly. and a lot of people don't know that. And you got Norman Lewis. And all these artists who are around during the abstract expressionist movement, but when we would be making art in that genre or in that in that style, it would be considered amateur or 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 primitive or whatever. And, and, it, and it was just up, this are not up are not to the level, not which is you know not common. to the level. And it's just and it's just right. biased. And that I mean it's it's a it's a similar it's a similar track with with within dance. I mean I I came up through the classical arts i came up through classical ballet i mean that was Mm -hmm. i mean that was my jam but every time i would say i was a dancer the first thing they would ask oh modern because there's a bias against the black body moving through space i mean i was Mm. i'm I'm built a little bit like a linebacker (laughs) so i'm I'm a thicker (laughs) guy but it doesn't it doesn't preclude a a line it doesn't preclude an ability for rhythmic movement and shape making which I love. That's uh-huh. I think that's why I respond so well to your work. When I see your work, I go, "Oh, this is my world." I'm trying to do the shapes. I'm literally in. I, right I, I stand in front of your paintings and I start moving. <laughs> and right so, on, yeah. but but it, but that's that 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 bias is universal. This these kind of like yes. okay, these are these are very arbitrary decisions. I mean, if you let go of the bias and step back and go, I see everyone's capable of doing. You see, oh. He's rhythmic. Oh, he's physically strong. He can make a line. He can touch your heart. He can do, he can act as well. I mean, so, the, so that's mm-hmm. why I, 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 and I love the fact that your parents raised you to be comfortable being at every table and that, and so tell your parents, thank you, because I see it and how you conduct thank yourself. You. It, it comes through, it comes through loud and clear. And so I, I just, I just fell in love with it. It's just the fact that, you know, this kind of you recognize that these things have occurred, but you've never let them be a, a, an inhibition to moving forward. And right. so I want to give you props for that one, sir. <laughs> thank, you, and, thank you. I mean, thank you. And and likewise to you. I mean, if you're going to be, you know, in this game a long time, you're, you're going to understand that adversity comes from all different shapes and sizes and colors and, and, and different time periods. And, you know, and you're going to get it for, for because of who you are and what you are. And, and, and it's just, it's just the way it is, but it's almost kind of like you can use it to your advantage because all eyes are on you anyway. And right. if you exceed past even your own expectations, you can rule the world, you know? I, I, I love that. And, and one of the things that is that, 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 
you talk about that and, and I've been on I've been very lucky and this is to the audience is that to be in group shows with, with Cedric and um and also to have worked in other collaborations at the at the West Side Library in Dayton, Ohio, which mm. it, you have an opportunity to see your work publicly. That's the other thing about this is that you have this really robust career that's work that's being sold plus work that's being commissioned. And I'm kind of curious, is that was that because you, you talked about COVID kind of changing everything. Have you stepped away from the teaching aspect and totally focused in on art? You know, I, I, I've been encouraged many, many years by my wife to, 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 to just just focus in and stop teaching. And so what ended up happening when, we, when I, I think I came back to school for one year after COVID and it was just tough. It was just tough taking temperatures and and all that stuff and it just showing up early. It was just, it was just, it was just, I mean, it's all about safety and precautions and caring and devotion. And it wasn't just taking temperatures. I mean, there was, there was a lot of formal things that, that, that were starting to just, just burn me out. But I think what it was, was the fact that I was teaching a curriculum that wasn't based around my work. You know what I mean? I know it's, I know it sounds very you know egotistical, but I like going in to these schools as a guest artist and being able to teach him about me and what I do and what I love and trying to see what we can create together that is inspired by what I normally do in the studio, but taking it another step further because they'll be working with me. Even though I could have done that at St. Francis and other schools in the full-time realm, it's just exciting. Those short, those short-term residencies and opportunities, you know, whether it's, I'm, I'm going to start teaching at a teens art class for the Kennedy Heights Art Center. And so I think those opportunities are what I want to gravitate to because, you know, you're allowed to free yourself to do your own work during the day, but at the same time, you're really honing in on individuals that have a divine interest in the visual arts. And I think that's what I'm, what I'm gearing towards, you know, ma- making sure that I'm surrounding myself with like-minded youth that would want to execute and, and, and make magic happen, you know? Oh, I love that. I think that's really cool. And that's, that's, that's part of the reason why I still teach. I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. I, that there's, there's something about that energy to being mm-hmm. with that, uh, that, that youthful energy, that, that, that willingness to be open to yes. as you call it the divine i think it is the divine i think it's there's a spiritual yes. capacity to to art making and 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 it comes through in your work and it comes i hope it comes through mine i, I mean i, yes, I try i i i really have as i tell my parents all the time i have i've made this a 24 7 proposition and so i mean i think it's really kind of fun. to me it's really amazing your parents, they sound exactly like my parents. <laughs> like, were they like, <laughs> yes. are they, are they one in the same? I mean, I mean, <laughs> they, my, my, when I told my parents that I was like, I was a visual artist and all of a sudden I'm going to be a ballet dancer. They were just like, they kind of just went, okay, if that's what you want to yes. do. And, you know, so they didn't see it as odd. And I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think that's important. So, so what would you tell parents whose children are starting to show, that creative spark, that, that, that openness to, I was, we call it the divine. What would you, what would your advice be to parents who have those people in their midst? So to speak. I would just encourage them even more to, I was listening to Terrence Hammonds do a lecture at the Taft Museum of Art where he has a current exhibition. And, and he was talking about how his mom would partner up with his art teacher at the school of creative performing arts in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and actually take him to the art museum and have him write artist statements or papers or like book reports about the artist there. And I always thought that was, I mean, when I, when he told me that I was like, no wonder he has a real sense of purpose within his work and the, in the, in the sense of the conceptualization of it and being able to put it in writing and put it in words and end up in museums. That's the kind of devotion I would encourage parents to do. If these kids are really into it, have them be able to write about it. Have them think about the business sense of it. Because that, having him do a book report, is the business sense of it. The writing the proposals. It's one thing to take a art, additional art lessons and burn your kid out. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Because sometimes you can get arted out. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, but yeah. it's another thing. <laughs> It's another thing that, you know, to 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 really also encourage them on another level of how you're going to promote, how you're going to brand, how you're going to market, how you're going to articulate about what you do and how, you know, the language of the arts. So I would just inc- just become involved. If they're interested in it, just sit down with them and ask them why. Have them talk about why. Have, you know, just really get invested into it. And encourage them to expand that 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 genre of, of the arts, visual as well as dance. I mean, and and yeah, it's it's very important. They're gonna have to make their own decisions on how bad they want it, but at the same time, they can also just simply not discourage them. That's the biggest thing. Don't discourage them. I mean, the fact that your parents were like mine in the sense that they just said, Yeah, that sounds great. Even just saying that makes a world of difference. It probably means more than anything so I, that's what i would say just in your response just be encouraging because it, it makes a world of difference i love that and so i mean that's and i i i wholeheartedly agree on that yeah just let them just let them be let them let them kind of but i love to talk about the language being able to articulate because i think a lot of people think that the artistic process is just magic and fairy dust it's 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 thoughtful <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's thoughtful consideration. Yeah. And there's a thoughtful exactly. consideration to shape and form. The fact that your influences are as wide ranging as music and, and, and African American artists who come before in the abstract realm, plus modernist work, plus social contemporary things that are happening and events that are happening in our world. And it all comes through in this abstraction and that vibrancy in the work. I mean, it's there, the subtexts are there. And I think that's what just makes your work so rich. Um, the The other question I have is because you are a artist who's been around for two and a half decades. And when I say when you when you use the words marketing and branding, the business of art, I love the fact that you're unabashedly talking about it because I think yeah. sometimes there's this tendency to one like, oh no. I'm the artist in the garret. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. time out. Yeah. Time out with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I, nice. I, I, it... Yeah. But, but, but what would you say to these artists who are using that as the thing, like the myth of art making? It's like, well, to do whatever goes with your branding. I mean, some of these, that, that's part of their branding and not, not mention that they have a branding. I mean, and I totally get it, but it, it's, it, for me, it's, it's, it's to, it's to, you know, to, to be honest. I mean, I, I can't, I, I was asked by the Taft Museum of Art, you know, and you can see the response if you go on Instagram and you'll see a little interview. They asked me as an abstract African-American artist if I ran into some hesitation or some bias by, you know, from 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 other people, from whether it be my own community or the other community. And and one of the things I said in my response, I used the word marketing. And I said, you know, I can't tell you word for word what I said, but I said something like there are certain expectations as us as African-American artists about what we should be creating. And knowing that when I decided to decide I was going to become an artist, I was very conscious of my branding and wanting to make sure that people would respect me, would want me to make art based upon the fact that I was African-American. So I was very aware of maybe pursuing that and me using the word branding i i asked my wife i was like should i have used the word branding should i have used the word branding and but honestly that's the truth i mean you you you're out there putting your work in museums you're out there putting your work in galleries you're out there putting your work in in these in in booths in these in these places where you're retailing your work and and your branding is how you shape who you are i mean and 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 it sounds very it sounds very kind of a commercial but it's the truth it's it's just and it's another word for presentation it's another word for grooming combing your hair it's just the same thing it's just it's just how you present yourself marketing branding i don't know the way to express it you know you can say your expression my 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 what i'm protruding out but I, I just branding i mean that's that's all it is i think we all do things that are important to us based on how we feel 
but what we decide to purchase and buy and to put around our bodies, it's branding. It's it's just what it is. It's it's you can right. change it's, it's, it. And that's it's, it's, it, and it's you. It, you it's it, it's in you. Essence, when you talk about birth, it is you. And I love it because you used the phrase. You said it's the authentic, os, honest you is the brand. Yeah. Name. So you may be the yeah. person who goes, oh, no, I don't I don't deal with the business side. I just, you know, that's great. That's lovely. That's who you are. But don't. But that's your branding. But <laughs> that's your branding. Yeah. And, and, and there's room for everyone's. I guess it goes to the point of there's room for everyone's branding. Exactly. Exactly. And it's not one way to do it. And there isn't. You would... Oh, go ahead. You got to be open. You got to be open. You have to be, you know, perceptive to other different ideas and thoughts and other ways that others are going to, to you know, express themselves. And at the same time, you have to understand that what you have is your own unique thing that you can bring to the table that's just as important just as masterful and just as just as valid. Picasso was a master brand master at branding himself. You know, Andy Warhol, you know, a lot of I mean the, the list goes on of great artists that paint what they feel, but also know how to brand it. And there's and then one thing my professor said, he goes, when art's in the studio, it's in the studio. When it be, when it leaves the studio it's a business. That's it. That was Terrence Corbin. You know, he was also the professor of Kevin Harris, you know, a friend of ours. And- oh, yes. Oh, you know, you know, I'm a fan of Kevin. So, and yeah, yeah. yeah that, great that, guy. And so that's it. That's ultimately, the, that's the essence of it. It is a business. It's like dance. It's like, I may be in the Klaus Arts, but it's an industry. It's a business. I have to show exactly. up prepared to do brise vole i have to show up being able to lift a girl and partner a girl in a tutu i have you know that's the business (laughs) as soon as you drop her you're not dancing (laughs) you're not partnering anyway (laughs) let's put it that way you're not partying if you drop her so you got to be prepared for it i love it i absolutely love it so oh cedric this has been awesome i am so glad that people are, are hearing your voice and getting to know you because and i'm saying this to everybody who's listening go check out his work you will you will be invigorated and you will Thank sense you. you know that life is worth living after seeing his work. Amen. So. Thank you. Rodney Veal's Inspired By is a production of Public Media Connect, the regional partnership of CET in Cincinnati and Think TV in Dayton. There's a lot of great art happening around Southwest Ohio and we're excited to be part of it. If you like this episode, Please subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can learn more and find the show notes at thinktv.org forward slash inspired by or cetconnect.org forward slash inspired by. Thank you.